uh, I came into this with a bunch of questions that I wrote down to ask this panel, who is um, representing uh, different institutions, different kinds of institutions, different systems, and literally a cross-section of the United States. And then as the day went on, I wrote down a lot more questions. So I'll, I'll steal Brad's joke uh, that I, I should hopefully get everybody out of here by 8 or 9 o'clock tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I kid, I kid. I promise we'll be done right on time. Uh, and then don't get up, I'll say this now, don't get up as soon as the panel is over because there's a little bit of housekeeping, 10 or 15 minutes of housekeeping at the very end um, that we just need to do uh, before everybody leaves. But uh, even though I wrote down all these questions that I know I won't get through, I do want to have uh, the opportunity for all of you to ask questions of this panel. All day you've been promised the opportunity to ask questions because we've been running so tight on time. And so I have to fulfill that promise and let you have uh, the chance to ask some questions. But I'm going to invoke moderator's per prerogative first and ask some questions. But just to kind of refresh everyone's memory of who our panel is, starting closest to me and moving forward, we have Rhonda Epper, who is the assistant provost for the Colorado Community College System. We have Diane Harley, who is senior researcher from the Center for Studies in Higher Education at the University of California, Berkeley. We have Tom Caswell who is Open Education Policy Associate at the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges. Brad Wheeler, Vice President for Information Technology and CIO at Indiana University. And last but certainly not least, Stephen Acker, Research Director at the Ohio Digital Bookshelf Project. So let me start with what I was going to end with because I think we're going to run out of time. And let me find my question. And I'd like each of you to maybe give me just a little bit on, on this question. So we've got a lot of people in the room who are in various stages of interest in or activity in digital text. And if they're either starting, thinking about it, maybe they're very mature in their implementation, but there are various points in the spectrum and they, re they represent various different kinds of institutions. So what advice would you give an institution who is looking to get started with a digital text initiative? Keeping in mind that we have some highly controlled environments like what uh, Rhonda described at CCC Online, which is a master course template. You have a lot of kind of centralized control over the kinds of implementations that you do to a highly autonomous environment with a lot of faculty choice like IU or UC Berkeley and like UCF, where I would never get away with what you're doing in, at, in Colorado. So with that in mind and then from your own perspective and th thinking about who's in the room, What's sort of like the one thing that you would, you would advise folks here to keep in mind as they go forward with the digital text implementation? Do you want me to start? Yes, we'll start and we'll work our way down. So my advice would be um, to start a pilot. Um, I think um, Sean mentioned that as his advice as well. When you're starting off with a program like this, even though in Colorado in our system we are very centralized we have a standardized model. We could not have pulled it off, I don't think, without the leadership of faculty, um, early adopters, who were very enthusiastic and excited. And so we got them engaged early on and um, introduced them to the concept, what we were trying to do, and had them um, work with the, the learning material. Uh, one of our um, central premises when we kicked this off is that we weren't just looking for ebooks. Um, it was more than an ebook, but digital content altogether. I don't think I, I really made that point in my earlier presentation that this materials charge that's applied to students includes all of the ancillary assets, the homework systems that go um, with the ebook. And I think that um, may be why faculty, our, our central core faculty, brought, bought into the concept early on is that it really was going to transform. Uh, the learning experience for students in these courses. Um, I just want to say only a man who's never worn a skirt would set up a panel this way. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I have not. <laughs> um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to speak to the adoption of new models, and I'd rather comment on involving faculty in authoring in one form or another. And I would say that, yes, the institutional 
contexts are very important, as in a UC Berkeley or, UCS or UCF. It's, you're not going to be able to dictate to faculty what they're going to use in a course, although Brad can speak to this at IU. But I'm interested in the idea of faculty putting energy into not only creating materials, but having to do that kind of customization that's required. It takes time. They need rewards and incentives. And those rewards and incentives don't come from the bottom. They come from the top. So I would say that university leadership has to be involved in these discussions and has to take a proactive uh, a role in saying, okay, we are going to make the move to digital. And these are the various roles that faculty can play, and these are the incentives both in the reward system and perhaps monetary that we can provide. So just, I would add that it's important to plug into existing consortia and I think that what we have here today is a, is a perfect example. We can learn from each other's uh, successes as well as from each other's failures. And so um, don't reinvent the wheel um, if it's not a good wheel. If it's a good wheel, then go for it. Build, build another one. But um, plug into the, communicate and plug into, especially to the consortia that are available to you in, in your area. So to Diane's point, I think you see when agency goes badly, because I asked for a stage that would raise the table and the chairs. <laughs> but uh, somewhere agency along the way at the hotel got us a different outcome. So apologies. Apologies for that. Um, my, my view is know your goals, pursue them now. Get involved, start, pilot, do things, but know your goals, what you're going after, and pursue them now. And I guess I'd begin by saying, don't do a pilot. The first thing to do is to go to all the other people who have done pilots and talk to them in, in depth and with trust and benefit from all this work that's been going on for the last 10 years. Then recognize that any kind of data or experience that we have should, be, should repeat itself at least three times before it becomes stable. The innovation continues to change. The use environment or the faculty who are using these technologies continue to change. You don't know what's going on until the second or third or fourth time that one of these things has been in place. Because we're all unstable and our, our, our antenna are out here trying to figure out what's happening until we settle into that particular process. The other thing is I, I think that it is definitely the case you need senior leadership and you need faculty buy-in. It's the, it's the jaws of innovation. You have to bite from both sides if you're gonna make anything happen. Brad, you just said something about knowing what you want to accomplish, sort of knowing what your goals are for, for getting into the digital text world. And typically what I have always read and what seems to be in the press and has certainly gotten the attention of the legislature here in Florida is the cost of textbooks. And so it seems to be one of the driving factors behind the push for digital text is to alleviate the cost burden on students. But I heard a couple of times today um, another uh, factor to consider, I'll, and I'll, I'll quote Dr. Graydon, uh, who said, lower price is not a sufficient reason alone for adopting an e-text. Uh, there must be an intellectual payoff. So let me ask you, to what extent do you think that the collaborative, the interactive, the, um, the kind of uh, markup features that are in digital text, the capabilities that are there that extend it beyond simply reading something online that's cheaper, and you can get uh, printed. How important is that uh, What in, in, the, in the list of various things that are important to the entire value proposition of digital texts when you're talking to students and you're talking to faculty? Maybe whoever has the microphone. Uh, I'll just comment with what, what we've heard, and that is in some ways this is Maslow's hierarchy. I mean, you know, you are first for, worried about psychological well-being before self-actualization. And right now, what hurts is price and cost and this mutual dysfunctional spiral that's going on between student behavior and content creators behavior so i think we're at the bottom we are trying to solve that right now i buy into the to the the aspiration of where we're going i think the annotation is good students love it i mean one student said Duh. when i showed it to them this was a student leader group they said ah this is like facebook for textbooks 
Um, whether that's good or bad, you can make your own conclusion. But they got it. And the ability to work together socially. Uh, you know, I, in terms of the social working together, it's going to happen somewhere. I, I don't think we can preclude it. So why not make it and, and, and tag onto it for pedagogical value and instructional value? To, to our publisher colleagues, I think you're right. The learner analytics, the, the, the changes, the adaptive learning stuff, it's coming and it is going to really matter a lot. But we got a year or two until it matters as much as we all hope it does. I just want to add to that that I, I think that you're absolutely right. If we are 100% solely focused on cost, we're selling ourselves short and we're ignoring the incredible affordances of digital content. <clears throat> At the same time, I think that uh, because of the times that we're in, I think that cost is uh, very much um, you know, it's it's the um, it's the focus of the day, and and so um, I I would just encourage us all to to not get so um, used to playing that one chord that we forget the incredible um, affordances of digital content. And and I think that it's absolutely the case that affordability is the headline of the day, but I, I still think that the majority of the states and the nation at large is concerned about student outcomes. So it's all about return on investment. If we can, I'd rather increase the outcomes and reduce the price. I think both are good. It's a double hit if you can get both. But the key is to improve learning outcomes. And I think part of the challenge facing content creators is whether you're prepared to give up the sense of author. And instead, consider the, the learner as as the recipient and the benefactor of the materials. I'm not sure that I want an entire book from A to Z from the same voice. I think that a, a very large number of our students would like to be able to select from a library of resources that your content um, creative capabilities can produce. I don't think it has to start from A to B. I don't think you have to throw away 60% of your first editions. I think you need to find a way to reuse parts of those 60% that don't get to go to second edition to to build the additionless textbook, which is where this all should go, I think. If I can add one more thing, though, this is a narrow window of time, I do believe, in shaping the marketplace by asserting how we wish to buy. So as eText first came forward, digital stuff, or print stuff going digital, the offers in the marketplace said no printing or very, very restricted printing. I, there, you know, I saw a sign recently said, on this book you can print 72.4 pages. You know, I mean, these, are, these were rules. I spent an afternoon on the summer uh, of my deck in a discussion with somebody as we were working on a contract on, okay, students can, they can print out of our license, but they can only send one page at a time. I said, that's what pledges are for in fraternities. So, you know, that's not going to solve a problem. We ultimately worked to a term that made a lot of sense. And so I do believe there is a narrow window for the supply side to assert what they think is in their interest and they would like to sell and for us to assert how we would like to buy. And we have already demonstrated we're finding a lot of common ground when we really have that conversation. Front of you. Um, yeah, Brad's comment just reminded me early in our negotiations, and I won't name the publisher, but um, there was a limitation on page views. You could only actually look at the page so many times, um, and then it disappeared. <laughs> um, but we have evolved, um, I think, pretty far since then. And I, I think, in fact, um, the very definition of, of what an ebook is, or what a textbook is, is changing. And, and when I talked this morning about our two overriding goals, they were to enrich the learning experience and to drive down costs. I don't think we really knew how the, the learning experience part was going to unfold. We, we kind of knew what, what the cost boundaries were. When we started out, we had primarily PDFs, and now I'm just amazed at what the publishers are bringing forward in terms of the level of interactivity in the eBooks and the ancillary resources on the websites in terms of uh, video and um, hyperlinks and all the different things that are included um, and, and um, the homework exercises and adaptive learning that is just, um, it really does enrich the learning experience for students. So I'm going to ask one more and can then I'm going to... Can I just make a quick oh, yeah, comment? Um, 
from my perspective, it seems to me you have to have a pretty strong feedback loop between what you're piloting or even not piloting what you've adopted and how it's being used. And I know that there are built-in analytics for that, but also some basic social science research about how students are using it, how faculty are using it, and make expensive, and this was is brought up by the publishers, that constant iterative process of improving the, the materials based on the feedback you're getting from users. And that research itself costs money, and that should be built into whatever you're doing. I, I'm going to ask one more question from my list, and then I'm going to open it up uh, to, to the audience. And this question, I guess, is for any or all of you. Oftentimes, it seems like a digital text initiative is coming from one of two sources. It's either coming kind of bottom up, individually, kind of at a grassroots, individual faculty are adopting something or doing something innovative, which is hard to scale. Or it's coming top down from a, a statewide consortial, consortium or from an institutional standpoint, kind of being pushed down on, on uh, faculty and convincing them, socializing, to get them to adopt it. Um, so what do you think is the role of a, of a grassroots bottom-up versus a top-down state level or at least large institutional level uh, administrative uh, initiative to make this work, to make this successful? And how do you reconcile those two poles, if you will? I'll just say that I think the strength in numbers aspect of of the of the large the larger organizations um, shouldn't be ignored. I think that um, the reason we're able to realize some some substantial efficiencies in Washington State is because uh, we're we're serving over 400,000 students. Um, we we have um, system wide LMS purchases um, that kind of thing. And and when you when you're buying for 34 colleges and the four years get involved and it's everybody all together, then you can you can you know you can realize some pretty some pretty good uh, efficiencies that way. Um, so that's one thing that I think that you can do from the top down. From the bottom up, I I, I would say that it really does take um, it it takes buy-in and commitment from faculty to be able to uh, to get involved. We've we've never mandated anything. Uh, with the, the Washington um, OER initiatives, with the Open Course Library, and all the rest, we incentivize, and then um, and and we provide um, the 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 time and the and the resources to be able to get involved. But um, but really, we uh, that's that's an important the the grassroots and and the individual faculty involvement is is key to, and 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 doing it out of their own free will is, is key to, to making something, something successful on a, on a larger scale. I've also heard it said that the way to herd cats is to control the cat food, right? And so at the state level, you have the ability to buy more cat food, I suppose. The only thing I, I will add is, um, for us, I don't think, you know, Tim or Dan or Tom, they wanted to go to each campus of Indiana University one at a time and try to work out all the legal challenges and Mickey and, and such, so that we were able to aggregate some demand, some reasonable approach to doing this. They were able to work with us to a deal to address 110,000 students at Indiana University as a probable, possible uh, market. And then we just enabled all of that. That was kind of the top down. We get the gears in place. But then the bottom up is faculty making their choices. And if this turns out to not be the right set of choices, we'll learn and we'll adapt uh, over time. But for a big complex place like IU and what Diane's described for Berkeley and some others, that's, it, it's, both, it's both directions uh, to get there. And I guess I would say that th those two jaws are the extrinsic motivation. So you start with the, the system to the institution, to the dean, to the chair. And all of those interplay to provide the external incentives for, for folks to change. The individual faculty then intrinsically decides that there's a reason to change, to improve the student's learning and harvest the rewards from these other resource providers. But those who set the in extrinsic incentives have to provide the resources for the faculty to learn the changes in behavior. And that's something that we're not especially 
good at providing all of those workshops and opportunities to learn how to do this differently if we indeed want that to occur. Um, I think uh, perhaps the way that I've described how we work in the Colorado Community College system um, sounds very centralized because I'm talking about the consortium, um, CCC Online, that operates out of the system office in which all of the 13 colleges participate. But each of the 13 colleges um, are independently accredited institutions and they do their own thing um, as well. And so there's a lot of bottom-up type projects um, going on at the campuses. And um, at the system office, we also do try to incentivize um, bottom-up type projects from faculty. Currently, we have a $3 million initiative underway where we're going to fund individual and collaborative faculty projects around game-based learning and um, provide support at the system level. And we're working with a group of faculty leaders from all of the campuses. So in that sense, we're providing some structure around a priority that we want to support, but um, hoping that there will be individual and collaborative faculty initiatives that um, come up from individual faculty entrepreneurs. Okay, there's a question up front. Yeah, one of the things that we didn't talk about today is the student's perspective. Um, and I'm from the University System of Ohio, and each one of our institutions is governed by individual board, even though we do have a board of regents that controls the whole system. And our fastest growing population of students at the community college level are between 26 and 35. And there are little less uh, technologically savvy as the 18 year olds that are coming into school. And I've wondered, I'm wondering if any of you have any experience with the kinds of programs that you would offer these students uh, and, and touch on whether or not it's really fair for the faculty to be a, to have to teach the content and the technology when they're switching over to an ebook. I'll I'll comment on that because during lunch I checked. So our support center, which is a support center for everything on all campuses, phone lines go there. The, the centers for teaching and learning uh, work there as well. And so for uh, as we get in the fifth week of class. Again, 5,300 students, we've had 77 contacts in total about e-text use. We have many older students and on our Gary campus, at, at not Bloomington, but the other campuses. And uh, the tools have matured so much that the learning curve on them is nowhere near what it was even a year or 18 months ago. So the support is an issue, you know, Tim, I think mentioned that as a, a cost. I think the more you get that support thing closer to the students, rather than them having to call, you know, Cengage and trying to figure out where they're at, what's going on, what, you know, the more you get that closer to them. The other thing I will say is, um, we did choose on our eText website, we have snippets of tutorials of how to do things that are just little videos that are about 60 seconds or 90 seconds. You know, you want to add someone to your study group. You want to mark this. You want to use it offline. And so we have found instruction to students on a lot of these things. We licensed the lynda.com stuff for the Adobe suite and all. When we've tried various tutorials before that did not work. But chunking that into very small episodic lessons of I'm trying to do this and in 30 seconds or 60 I can learn how to do it has helped immensely. Um, we did look at the age um, demographics and how it's stratified out by the number um, of students who are purchasing the print text and there does seem to be um, an age factor there. Uh, older students tend to want that print copy. Um, I'm included, I, it's sort of what we grew up with, but I was telling someone earlier, um, this is I think going to be less of an issue as, well, every year, as the technology becomes more sophisticated, we have fewer and fewer of those calls, and our students are coming in with greater technology skills. Um, my son is in eighth grade, and he's using a digital math book. 
um, that he reads a lot of the time on his iTouch. And um, it sort of um, blows my mind that he can do that to begin with, or that he actually prefers to use that sometimes. Um, but it also makes me think that by the time he gets to college, that, um, I think a print book will n not be something that he's expecting to see in any of his classes. Is there one in the middle, question? Um. The question is about ADA compliance and how that's being addressed. I think I raised that, so if I could just make, make two comments. Number one, I, I think it's reasonable to say that there is no universally accessible solution out there. And I believe it's fair to say that the universal design community is asking for milestones between now and some defined future. And we need to hit levels one, two, and three compliance over the next five years, for example, because there is such sunk investment in a number of platforms that the first step is awareness, the second step is to begin to bring about the change, and the third is to hit these levels and to allow it to be certified by the user community. One of the things that we're trying to do with our open educational resource site is to recognize that especially in systems in which there are no commercial incentives like OER, we're particularly bad at accessibility issues. So. We're using it as a faculty awareness device where we identify those resources which are accessible and say, oh, by the way, are you aware that this is not? And if not, here's a set of uh, resources that can substitute in for that particular limitation. For us, it's not, at Indiana, it's not at the state level, it's at the institution level. That is where the concern is. Our friends in Ohio recently had a wonderful gathering about accessibility. We had people over at it. And the key things that came, came out of there and in, in our conversations with some of the accessibility groups are, one, be serious about getting there. Two, have real progress that you're moving and showing that you're getting there and doing things. And you talked about stage one, stage two, stage three. Um, you know, directional is not enough on its own. They want to see you've got a plan and you're marching it and you're having uh, outcomes. The bulk of our work has been with our platform provider, and that is uh, course load, and they've been working a lot on, on that direction. I will say our Center for Adaptive Technology, this actually has helped as we are getting more of the materials, uh, for those that are adopting our e-text program, as we're getting things in in digital, it has given them more tools to work with for students who contact them with particular needs. Um, from Colorado's perspective, we've been really fortunate um, in working with Pearson for the majority of our digital courses that they do pay attention to accessibility and they've done a really nice job um, making sure that they meet the, re that the e-books meet the requirements. Um, in addition to that, I mentioned earlier, our lead course designer um, is adamant. She checks every link, every website, every assignment, um, and if something comes back, uh, the other day she found something that had light gray text on a white background, and um, of course that's a big no-no, and um, so she works with the publisher to fix these sort of things, and I would say that any publisher that gets through um, Donna's analysis is probably good to go um, anywhere in the United States with, with their product. But that is the number one reason also that our courses get delayed in terms of implementation. So we need a, a Donna certification for all of our, <laughs> yeah. our materials. Just to piggyback on, on what's already been said, um, and it's true that open resources tend to have uh, a really bad name in accessibility. Um, and uh, a lot of things end up either being retrofitted or, or not at all. Um, with the Open Course Library, we actually started with that knowledge, and so accessibility was at the at, was baked into the it, right into the um, in, in from the start. And so um, so we have all of our all of our faculty go through an accessibility training who are going to be involved in creating resources and. Um, and I don't think there is anything as, you know, it's, 
uh, some people make it sound like a checkbox. Um, it's, it's, you know, there are, like we've said, there are levels of accessibility and, and you're never actually there because there's always going to be someone who for, you know, who doesn't fit all of the things that you've tried to do. Um, but, but we certainly, um, we need to be designing with accessibility in mind, whether it be um, for uh, publisher materials or, or materials that are created, um, uh, you know, by faculty and, and put out into the open or something in between. Um, because let's remember that um, this isn't an either or, you know, this isn't binary. It's not, um, I, think, I think that uh, now we're getting publishers who are doing open resources. So, so you've got the whole spectrum and um, so everyone needs to think about accessibility up front because retrofitting is hugely expensive and, um, and it really doesn't make sense when you can control the accessibility at the beginning. It doesn't make sense, to, especially in the digital world, to wait until you've made a thousand copies and then go figure out how to make all of those accessible um, at, at the individual colleges. If you get it right up front, um, you know, it's, it's much, much more efficient. One more question here in the middle. Um, I wanted to just change the pace a little bit here, the, the focus a little bit. Um, I'm thinking more in terms of where this whole, um, uh, the digital learning is going. And a lot of the conversation, I realize we're talking about digital textbooks, but a lot of the conversation has been more on um, the method of delivery and basically that, you know, digital textbooks are um, pretty much print textbooks put into a digital form. And what I'm, what I'm interested in is you're, you're thinking about where we're going with the experiential um, learning that comes with digitization and with um, having access to uh, databases, um, equipment that is digital and then can be connected into computers that gives students an opportunity to do real time, um, perhaps research or, or investigation. And um, that seems like a, an area where we really need to, s we need to catch with students. Um, they're ahead of us in many ways in terms of, you know, the idea of using your, your smartphone in the classroom. Uh, you know, we're still responding as if there is no place for that in many cases. Um, and, I, and I think it's the, it's the taking and saying, instead of having, have, having to get students up to speed on how to access um, uh, LMSs or that sort of a thing, to having them actually um, using technology as tools in the classroom actively where they're controlling to a large degree the learning um, that they experience in the classroom. And I'd just like to get your, your feedback, your uh, any in, uh, comments you might have on that. Well, I'll, I'll offer one. Um, I do think different disciplines, different styles of teaching can make different uses of the technology tools that are available. But the number one comment that I get about our learning management system from student groups, and this has held year over year, has been, can't you get the faculty to just use it in sensible ways, is basically is the point. Like, you know, put the syllabus in that clever thing called the syllabus button. <laughs> Don't go into the file manager and attach it as a Word document in a folder called stuff. Um, you, know, you know, so varieties of things like that. So on one hand, I hear that we want let a thousand flowers bloom if I, you know, take Mao and, and inflate it. Um, and then on the other hand, I hear from students a lot like, you know, I really don't want 17 innovative ways to just turn in a paper. It's a pedestrian task. I want a simple way to do it across various uh, classes. So that's a bit of the hygiene matters of courses. As far as the interactivity, in classes, like our friends up the road at Purdue, they've, they've created something called Hot Seat, using uh, mobile phones in class for polling, things like that. We've all had clickers, a variety of experiences. Some faculty are good at using them. Some have not figured it out. Some are self create exercises where students go out and self-direct with some of the resources that you've talked about. So I, I, I don't think it's one part of any of what I said. It's a little bit about all of it, heterogeneity, where it's valuable for learning, more consistency, where it's really the common thing that we're doing in all these classes and we don't need lots of disparate ways of doing it. I'd just like to second that, but I'd also say I think this is a perfect example where individual faculty will make those decisions about what fits into the pedagogical approach they want to use and the particular discipline or subdiscipline. Let me piggyback on that, that question. Do you want to add something, 
Um, I did, if, if there's time. Yeah, there. um, we have another project that is really pushing the envelope in terms of how to use technology um, in online instruction. I think that's maybe what you were getting at with your question. Uh, it has arisen from a policy issue within our state whereby um, science faculty in four-year institutions have questioned the validity of online science courses um, that are taught at a distance, particularly for the lab component of physics, biology, and chemistry. Um, we have funding through Next Generation Learning Challenges, Wave 1, um, to create a robotic science lab. Um, we're doing this in, with a group of institutions that are working with WICHE and BC campus up in British Columbia, Canada. We're replicating the model in Colorado, but this has um, arisen through, again, some of our lead innovative faculty who are really passionate about teaching online and really um, work very hard to make sure the students are, are meeting the learning outcomes, which are defined for every course within our system and at the state level. Um, for the student lab experience. Up until now, they have used lab kits. Um, simulations were, were not acceptable um, among the, the faculty and the discipline at the four-year level. So, but um, the lab kits have even been brought into question now. So this project allows students from their web browser to control sophisticated scientific equipment that we don't even have in all of our community college classroom-based science labs. Um, perform real experiments in real time, collecting real data, and working collaboratively in groups. Um, we have just launched it this semester um, with a physics course. Biology and chemistry are gonna be coming on in the summer. Um, but I think that may be the kind of thing that you're talking about in terms of really um, using the technology um, where students are actually learning and, and doing research and collecting data Correct. Correct. And for science, um, I, I think a lot of science today is done through robotics. If you look at deep sea submersibles, um, the kinds of data that we're gathering um, in space exploration, um, even in medicine, there's, um, I mean, surgery is being done at a distance. So um, our premise with this project is if all of this science can be conducted remotely, certainly we ought to be able to do um, freshman introductory level experiments in physics, biology, and chemistry. You know, with the recent um, uh, unveiling of uh, the new uh, Apple initiative in, in iBooks for digital texts, you know, that's a particular device that seems to become ubiquitous now on campuses seems to be changing the way students interact with content. And um, based on the demos that I have seen, potentially uh, has, has, the, has the ability to, to, to exploit the affordances of that environment, maybe more so than we're doing now, where it seems like in many cases we're sort of just remediating the printed textbook. Now I know there's been a lot of advances in interaction and video and media and stuff, but based on what I've seen on the iBook, uh, or in iBooks on the iPad, I wonder if, is it, um, is it really, is there a there there? Is this potentially a game changer or is it just one more player in an already crowded field? And I know this is a little speculative because I don't know how deep any of you have gotten into this yet, but I'd be curious looking forward kind of as a, as a couple year vision out, what you think that particular device might do and I know there's challenges with accessibility on the iPad as well, and if that might limit its, its deployment. Could I just say one thing, which has nothing to do with the technology and everything to do with the licensing? Sure. Which my understanding is if, if somebody creates content, they don't own it. Apple does. 
And I would say that is something everybody should think about. I don't know if that's right. It know. isn't? I don't know. Okay, they, they own, own the distribution rights, right. yeah. which yeah, still have, is still an issue. Huh? Right, and that's actually that was the comment I was just about to make. Um, well, I, I got it wrong, but that no, this is <laughs> we're, we're getting it right. This is collectively we're getting it right. Um, I think I think this is a huge opportunity. Um, but I actually think it, the opportunity is largely for the open resources and ex for exactly the reasons that we've just mentioned. Um, because Apple does control the distribution channel and because we're, we're, it's a distribution channel that's limited to a single device, um, I think that it's problematic for, um, uh, you'll still see you know, rich publications coming through, but um, this is not a Kindle approach to doing digital content. You know, I think a, a Kindle has devices everywhere, you know, and, and they don't, they're not trying to sell you a particular piece of hardware. So, so you can get it on, the, on a web browser, you can get it on iPhone or, or Android or whatever. Um, they're, they're sort of blasting buckshot style everything, and they want to make sure that their, their content goes everywhere. Um, this is, this is, this feels like uh, giving away the razor and selling razor blades with Apple. They're trying, you know, in this case, the razor blades are the iPads. Um, but, but I would say that, again, back to the OER um, case, because they only control the part about making money, um, it's, it's a huge opportunity for open resources because there's no limitation there saying that you can only distribute through the iBooks. Um, the same content could go out on Kindle and iBooks and, and any number of other um, uh, distribution channels. So, so um, and, and of course, how rich the content is is still absolutely, you know, it's a huge question. And, and I think that um, increasingly, I think that that's, that's really the domain where publishers can excel um, because, you know, that when I, when I talk about OER, a lot of it is really just very basic, flat content. And if I could just add one thing to the, to the Apple saga. Apple is deservedly recognized for its fabulous success in meeting the needs of an individual. But the diffusion process for individuals is way different than the diffusion process for organizations. And their entry into this market is a challenge for us rather than an opportunity for us for two reasons. First, that it separates the haves and the have-nots. And secondly, unless that they take the extensions that make a lot of this rich interaction associated with consuming knowledge, not producing it at this point, and fold it into EPUB 3, it's going to throw us back another six months, a year, or who knows how long until the new capabilities of, of the iBook platform appear in this much broader um, ecology in which we can all participate. That, that's a point. And the second is, from all of our data, the students are moving f towards if you ask them, do you want to watch, do you want to read, or do you want to do, what do you think they say? They're, they're interested in this interactive environment. The two things that that means are you get out of this consumption model, you get into the production model that we learned about in English. And secondly, you, you have to build aspirational outcomes that are concrete instead of conceptual. So all of our math curriculum ends up with this really cool thing called a MakerBot. Have you seen those? They're 3D printers, so our math students, when they finally get enough skills, they start producing remotely representations of physical events. So we have state maps that they're building and, and that kind of thing. That's where I think all this is ultimately going to go, into this interactive producership environment instead of how do we make it more rich to consume. If I can add one more great resource that is coming our, our way, and this goes to the lady's question who asked about, I, I didn't quite grasp it at first time, that like the scientific instruments, the shake tables, earthquake simulators, things like that, is some of you are tracking what's going on in national networking, and you may know during the, the stimulus, uh, Internet 2 and a number of partners got a large grant to upgrade the, the national backbone for connectivity. By this summer, that 100 gig connectivity across the nation will all be turned on. In fact, the thing has 88 separate 100 gig connections. That is a lot if you're trying to get your head around it. It's a lot. 
And, and so that's going to enable us to do more of these kinds of things that may be very bandwidth rich to our campuses. That doesn't mean we're going to get it to the cable modem at home necessarily in first pass. But we do have a whole big step up in infrastructure coming to higher education in some places, K through 12 in states where that's allowed, um, that really should give us a big new canvas to think about some of these touch and educational experiences, particularly with remote instrumentation and self-directed discovery. Rhonda, did you, I saw you make a move for your microphone. Do you want to say something? Um, well, a question occurred to me. I just wondered if any of the other panelists um, who know more about this Apple arrangement, if, so what would you do if you had a maintenance fee on that content, such as the calculus course? Would that then be considered making money? And would then would that not be considered open? Is it if there's any charge? You're not allowed to ask questions. You're on so, the panel. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's my I, weak attempt. I, to it's my get understanding it. that it can only reside on the iBook platform. So even if I wanted to put it in my IR, I could not. And I think this is the, this is kind of the hidden danger of the Apple authoring tool in that it's so seductive that a lot of faculty may go there. It makes it easy. It kind of breaks that faculty blood barrier, if you will. Um, it makes it easy to author the books and it just drives the product to Apple and therefore to the iPad. I, it's very seductive. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think this is the Hotel California. You, <laughs> you, you come in and you can never leave. Um, and I, Again, I think, but I, I have to say that, um, and I don't know the specifics of, you know, of their licensing um, to that degree yet, but, um, but I, it's, it's, a, it's a huge opportunity if, if, you're, if you're finding your revenue in other places. And I want to say it that way because this is not about not ever getting revenue. This is about looking in new places for revenue. And, um, and if you go that route, then, you know, it's a, it's, it's a huge opportunity. 